Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. You can follow us on Twitter at Thundercast underscore pod. Links to everything Thundercast social media is in the descriptions below, including Thundercast.online, where you can always find all kinds of really kind of kick-ass content from all across Herd Athletics. It's been a little bit again since we recorded last. There's been some huge news, and we wanted to push until the right time to record the show because it just made a little bit more sense. So, Russ... We've got some historic stuff to talk about, and we've got some just general great stuff to talk about. So let's get into it with a quick word from our sponsors at Laser Oliver PLLC. If you've been hurt in a wreck, call the law firm of Laser Oliver PLLC. Find them at 304carwreck.com. Well, I've been kind of anxious to talk about this one, Um, but there's just a whole... I feel like there's more than normal positivity in this episode just because of some of the things that were going on uh, this weekend or this through this weekend. Uh, it kicked off, you know, today. So get me started off with uh, at least five things that every Herd fan needs to know this week. Here's five things every Herd fan needs to know. As always, brought to you by Ignite Link, the Tri-State's premier IT management team. Number one, Marshall is fourth in the Boobas Cup standings after the winter sports have wrapped up. Yeah, I did see that, and and I'm kind of, I'm not going to say I'm surprised, right? Because we had some really strong finishes from some really strong sports, but uh, fourth is really respectable given the fact that some of our conference mates seem to kind of rule the roost in a lot of various aspects of athletics. So I'll take fourth through the fall and through the winter and uh, see how we can wrap it up after spring sports is done. Yeah, so for anyone that does not know, the Boobas Cup was named after the uh, first commissioner of the Sun Belt Conference, started in 1976. Uh, that was his last name. The way they score these is if there are 14 teams competing in a specific sport, men's basketball, women's basketball, number one gets 14 points, number 14 will get one point. And then if you win the regular season, um, you get an extra point or I'm sorry if you win the tournament you get an extra point so Marshall had uh well I think there were 14 so they picked up 15 for women's basketball alone they got 14 points for their first place regular season finish and then one point for winning the tournament and same thing for men's soccer they got 10 points uh for the league uh in the regular season and then they got one point in the postseason yeah, so like I said, there, there's obviously we have a couple of sports that are giving the lion's share of our totals, mm-hmm. but there are some programs out there that are really competitive across the board, and I think everybody kind of knows it. If you had to pick the top three, I don't want to do that, but most of our listeners and viewers could probably just off the top of their head say, mm, this is probably who's ahead of us. Mm-hmm. Still very strong for the herd with – still the spring sports seasons to, you know, kind of wrap up and um, tennis is just now getting underway in, in um, uh, conference play and softball, baseball and um, uh, track and field is now in the outdoor season. So there's a lot Mm -hmm. of areas where Marshall can make some ground and really vault into that top three, you know? Yeah. The uh, other thing too, is obviously uh, fielding a team, in the individual sports you know if you're only in six of the uh, athletic events you're not going to get as many points so we do a pretty good job of being in just about everything that uh, the Sun Belt offers and now we're going to increase that here in the next couple of years on to number two I thought this was so cool we got just a little bit to talk about that game later on Mm -hmm. but Bryce Blevins wins his second Sun Belt Conference Pitcher (laughs) of the Week award after his amazing performance yeah. 
at Southern Miss. So here's the funny part about that. I'm not, I want to talk about Bryce and what he did at Southern Miss, but here's the funny part just as, as it relates to us, because we post our clips and throughout the week. So some of the posts that happened to hit were when Bryce won the first SBC pitcher of the week, the day that he was announced to win his second one. So it was like, damn, we're really on top of things, but no, it was a clip from when he did it. Uh, earlier in the season, but I don't know what's going on with Bryce Blevins, but he is in the zone yeah. lately. And to go down and pitch a gym the way he did against a team like Southern Miss yes. is really, really impressive. Uh, Southern Miss historically is very, very strong in baseball. They're very, very strong again this year. And Marshall was on the backside of a really, really, let's just call it what it is, shitty way to lose that game. Mm -hmm. And uh, Coach Beals, I believe, was well within his rights to have lost his mind at that call. Um, but nonetheless, you can't change it. But catcher's interference to, cl to close out a game to for it to be a loss, is that, that's, that's just – it shouldn't happen, right? It shouldn't happen. And we've seen plenty of still photos. We've seen plenty of angles to say, like, this is ridiculous. There's no interference here. And yeah. then you see from other games that there were more egregious, like, catcher, quote, unquote, interference that wasn't called. So it just kind of rubs salt in the wound. All that to say this. Bryce Blevins went to Hattiesburg in a very intimidating environment and pitched a gym so much so that the official Southern Miss baseball Twitter account showed him a tip of the cap. Yeah. That's got to say something right there. Yeah, and we will talk about those stats and what he did in that game, so we're not repeating ourselves, uh, and it'll be a very quick wrap-up, but KD already told you about how that one ended, but how it got to that point is probably even more wild. All right, number three, Obina Anachili Killen, named to the NABC All-District 23, Second team. Yep, and I think uh, that is well-deserved, right? Because we talked about Obina and how his game developed and he turned into a, a more reliable three-point shooter even. But I think this now shines a even brighter spotlight on all of the movement that we've seen since our last show out of the men's basketball program. Between exhaustion of eligibility and guys hitting the portal, it is going to be massive roster turnover in Huntington. Two guys that haven't made a move yet, or we don't know if they will, but I'm surely hoping that they don't, is Obina and Nate Martin. So I think it really shines a light on the fact of how important Obina is to what Marshall men's basketball will need to try to accomplish in this offseason, in this recruiting cycle, these portal cycles, to field a more competitive team next season. But selfishly, I just want him to stay because he's been here, the yeah. West Virginia kid. We've talked about that a lot. And, and it's now getting to be a rarefied thing to where a guy that is a solid player, a really good player, uh, will begin and end his career at one place. Mm -hmm. So in this era of, of that becoming a more rare thing, selfishly, I want him to stay. I hope he wants to stay. I hope he's not entertaining leaving, but we touched on this briefly. You know, um, I could, there are maybe some academic uh, opportunities for him, and and you can't fault a guy for that, you know, but selfishly, if it's just a basketball decision, I hope he chooses to remain with the herd for his final go because um, I know he's a crowd favorite. He's been a crowd favorite. He's a high performer, and he's a guy that you, uh, coupled with Nate Martin, you can really – begin to put some pieces around and and try to put together something more competitive uh, in the fall. Because you already touched on this a little bit, I'm going to bump this one up. It was number five. We're going to put it to number four. Men's basketball has seen the following players enter the transfer portal. Pete Moe, Cam Crawford, Americ Toussaint, and Chase McKee. All of them entered the transfer portal. Thoughts on that, and then during this, you can go ahead and mention the other four that we knew weren't coming back because they exhausted their eligibility. Well, right. Well, everybody knows the guys that went through the senior senior day ceremony, but those four guys mm -hmm. and, and the ones that are leaving, it's a total, I can't remember, seven or eight, whatever it is. Eight. It's a lot. It's, a, it's eight. So, right so now, eight. eight. So eight guys currently. 
there mm-hmm. could be more movement, right? Mm-hmm. Inevitably, there will be movement in because it's going to be hard to field a competitive basketball team with remnants of a roster that yeah. you know isn't it won't be complete. So the the knee jerk reaction, of course, is going to be like, "What the heck is going on in Huntington?" Right? That's what most fans are saying. Oh well, this is a sign that you know, players don't like what's going on or, 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 or it's time for Dan to retire. That's what the initial knee jerk reaction is. But what you've got to understand is a couple of factors. A, not all of those guys were on scholarship, right? So it's not like scholarship athletes are, they, they might be leaving just like football guys do because there's scholarship opportunities elsewhere. Right. And they don't want to continue to pay their own way when they have an opportunity for a, a scholarship. Can't blame that. Right. Uh, secondly, there were just guys that may not, that may not fit into the future plans. And then you have the guys that just make the choice to leave. So it's not just everybody up and chooses to go for the same reason because they don't like, you know, we had a bad season or, or they don't like what's going on. In, it's not always that. Right. But no matter how you stir it, that's still a lot of vacancies that you're going to have to fill. Mm-hmm. And if it comes down the pipeline and you end up seeing someone like Obana and or Nate hit the portal, well, then you just begin to worry a little bit more about, man, how many impact players can we bring in and then have them all gel together to be a cohesive unit for the sprint or for the fall. Yeah. It's one thing when you're bringing in two, three, four guys, a couple of rotation guys, you know, some role players, but it's a whole other thing when you've got two of your starting five or, you know, two of your starting, let's say seven that uh, return. Oh, uh, you know, we, we expect guys like Connor to return. We expect guys like Fricks to return, but we don't know, you know, everybody has their own process. Um, but one thing's for sure. I didn't expect to see this many guys this quickly, but the, the other side of that is, now you know how many spots you have to fill. Now you have a better idea of, of how many offers you can put out there and you can really make a strong push early, right? So um, surprising news, not troubling news, but slightly concerning news. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and just to touch on uh, some of the things you said, Chase McKee, of course, he was injured all of last year. He played in five games for a total of 40 minutes this year. I don't know off the top of my head, the red shirt rules. If last year he got a, a, an injury red shirt and this year he got your more typical red shirt. I don't know. Um, Cam Crawford was uh, famously benched several games in a row, five games, six games, something like that. Had some uh, big moments off the bench and stuff like that, uh, but was always seemingly – either in what everyone would call the doghouse for lack of playing time or whatever. And there were, uh, this is not rumors that we're talking about. He, Cam Crawford said that in a Luke Creasy interview, Mm -hmm. you know, so this is nothing that we're fanning any kind of flames. He said, I was told that my play and my hustle and trying to fit into this game, he was just an open book about it. We talked about that. Um, So he is moving on and uh, Toussaint, and another player that has not declared, they we knew they were red shirting this year. They would not be playing. Um, and then you know you've got uh, um, Pete Mo not on scholarship. He, he came in here. He wasn't on scholarship this year. I'm assuming he got to red shirt. He didn't play any. He'll have four years to go play somewhere else. Uh, probably going to see if he can find a scholarship spot. Why wouldn't you, right? Yeah. Of all those names that you named, the guy that should be the most concerning has nothing to do with the portal. It's the guy that exhausted eligibility and it's Cam Kirkman, right? Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about that. That's a, That was a guy you're going to have to replace regardless. It just so happens that it, it it's compounded with three other guys that were seniors and four guys that hit the portal right now. Yeah. Voiles, senior, exhausted eligibility. Kerfman, senior, exhausted el- eligibility. Same thing for Serenich and for uh, Miladinovic. They right. both had been here the entire time, and uh, that opens up. You know, you've got eight spots now. Bring in uh, 
high school, a mix of high school and portal transfers. Hopefully you can bring in some guards and things that we had said all season that was kind of hurting this team. You know, you have a chance to build with less restrictions now. So uh, not everything is all bad news. You've got to try to find those silver linings. And that's one of them. When eight players in a matter of days are off your roster, four that you 100% already knew about, it allows you to do what you talk about in football and everything. It allows you an opportunity to try to better your roster. Yeah, that's the way you have to look at it, man. And mm-hmm. and it's it, I would again ask you just not to glare at the head coach and go something's wrong because right, Dan sure. D'Antoni did not automatically just forget how to coach basketball, right? He's right. still a well-respected coach, and just because there's a section of the fan base that thinks he should retire doesn't change the fact that he's forgotten more about basketball than I will ever know about basketball. But still, as long as he has the desire to coach, he's going to coach. Right. Uh, at least uh, through this season. And he's got one more extension, you know, out there. So give him the opportunity to, to, to field a, a team. And if we're asking these same questions at the end of next season, well, maybe we're having a different conversation. But for right now, we're not. So let's see what Dan and his team can do in the portal cycle and in high school recruiting cycles. And, you know, we've said it before. I'll say it again. If Andy Taylor was on this team, if he decided not to hit the portal, Marshall's a vastly different team. And we all know it. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a weapon that, that you were counting on having, that you were counting on being able to build around, and he hit the portal. And then Han Lofton hit the portal. And, uh, by the way, I got to say that, you know, we, we saw the injury to Micah, and even though he's a Gator now, uh, yeah. he's still always uh, going to be part of the Herd universe. And, and um, glad I saw that, you know, that he had to have surgery. Surgery went well. He's recovering just fine. He's at the NCAA tournament with, with the Gators supporting his team. So, we haven't forgotten about you just because you play in down in Gainesville now. Mm-hmm. Um, but if those two guys don't leave, Marshall's vastly different. We know mm-hmm. that. Yeah. So you can get those guys to come here. It's They've been here before. So why can't you go find similar type players to bring back into Huntington and try to make a go of it? Yeah. All right. Our fifth and final thing, homecoming is indeed, as we speculated, set for October the 5th against App State. Had to be. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to get technical, it kind of had to be. You still get that nice early fall, you know, late summerish type weather. It's going to be probably, unless it's raining or something, which always seems to happen on Marshall game days, uh, it gives you an opportunity for really kick ass weather for tailgating for people to come in and and they get to do uh, the whole tailgating homecoming experience against App State, which really covers a really big portion of the fan base, the older fans that even predate us that are Southern conference era folks. And now the new Sunbelt era fans that uh, have this more modern tussle with, with those Mountaineers. And we played them a few times in the conference USA era and the Mac era as well. So you really do encompass kind of everybody. I think it's great. And it's the SBC opener. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Usually I'm not a fan of, your conference opener being homecoming, but I like it this year just because of who the opponent is and that it's a draw to possibly get even more people in for homecoming that otherwise may not make the trip. Yeah. Start making your plans now. Uh, People always do. Of course, we have our amazing blowout, the first um, tailgate of the year, the first home game of the year, but we always look forward to homecoming as well. Start making your plans now, October 5th. App State at Marshall. All right, that does it for five things. And as usual, we have to thank Ignite Lake Tri-State's premier IT management team. Well, uh, pretty good five things. Um, I'd be lying to you if, if if, if I wasn't thinking about where this men's basketball team is gonna go, right? Like what, what is gonna be the, focus you know are we going to try to what are we going to do because historically dan wants to go find those sharp shooting guards and and you know that we have a we're going to need several of them <laughs> now so it seems like for the first time in a long time if no more movement occurs we're looking pretty decent down low <laughs> so where are we going to go from here but i don't know i'll take it um let's move on man i, I don't know how you want to handle this do you want to talk about 
women's basketball separately right now real quick? I think we should just because, uh, I mean, we're talking NCAA tournament here. So yeah. let's, let's handle that separately. Not a full feature, but we can talk about it, and then we'll move on to the more traditional around the herd. Yeah, well, let's do that then. We, we pick up from last episode. We hadn't even had selection Sunday yet. Turns out herd uh, lands at a 13 seed in the Portland Regional. Uh, region three in Portland type deal. They're going to Blacksburg to face the number four seeded Virginia Tech Hokies. So fast forward all the way around, right? Today was game day earlier this afternoon. We held off till tonight to record because why record and then play a game and then be several days late on reporting that. But um, did not go the way that I'm sure any of uh, those players and coaches had hoped it would go. And I don't just mean from a, win-loss standpoint. I think they figured they would be far more competitive in this game. A final score of 92-49 to absolutely is not indicative of the type of team that we continually saw on the floor for the Marshall Thundering Herd women's basketball program. Abby Beeman led the team in scoring just 12 points, added five rebounds and four assists, followed closely behind Mahogany Matthews, Brianna Campbell had uh, Mahogany Matthews had nine, Brianna Campbell seven, six apiece for Meredith Mayer and Aislinn Hayes, along with uh, Sydney Scott. And then the points started to dry up rather quickly. The only other herd player that uh, registered a point was Tamia Lawhorn. She had three. So it was not a good shooting day for the herd. Uh, that kind of continued over from the not-so-great shooting day in the SBC Tournament Championship game. Marshall, again, under 25% from the floor, Russ. That ain't going to win you a lot of games. 24.4% from the floor, only 14.6% from three. That's the killer. We mm -hmm. all know that. Marshall, just 6 of 41 <clears throat> from behind the arc. That's not going to win many games for any team, but especially a team that's built like Marshall and that plays the style of ball that Marshall tries to play. It was very obvious, at least to me, I'm sure to you and everybody else, that the size difference in this game was a massive factor. Marshall really just had no answer to the Hokies down low. Even their guards were bigger than our, our guards. And to make it all worse, Virginia Tech was just kind of on fire from the floor. So even with all those advantages that they had, they still shot over 50% from the floor and over 40% from three. Holy shit, it was just a perfect storm for the herd in a bad way. Nonetheless, I'm super proud of this damn team. I tweeted this, and I, I also want to talk to you more about this. We finished the season 26-7. and seven. I tweeted that. Coach Kim, the staff, and all of our players have now set a new floor for this program. And I firmly believe that. As long as Kim Caldwell patrols the sideline for the Marshall Thundering Herd, a new floor has been set. Until it's time for a rebuild, I feel like it's going to be a reload. That's that's In year one, you're going to the NCAA tournament. It feels like the rebuild is built. It happened in real time throughout the season. And now, every offseason, as long as Coach Kim is here, it's going to be a reload. Yeah, so uh, size just stands out to you. Even with the All-American six foot six Kitley that did not play and will not play for the entire tournament, torn ACL, um, they, I think, I'm not getting this wrong, six foot one was their smallest player. Oh, I don't know. What that would that would be was. that would be our tallest. Yeah. So um, they they may have had some guards coming off the bench, or maybe it was all but one. But they had guards at six one, and Mahogany Matthews is our tallest player at six one. Um, it was just a, a a drastically different style to play a team that tall, that long, and have to shoot over top of them. And you know, if they were in zone or man or whatever, you know, it was just they're going to alter shots they they blocked uh nine of our shots but it wasn't just your traditional down low blocks it was on jumpers it was on everything i thought they would kill us on the boards they had 43 total overall and we had 40 including yeah. 20 offensive boards so 
we played scrappy. We tried to do everything that we could. Um, but we've talked about this when you cannot hit your shots and then get into your uh, press, your press off of a missed shot is just not as effective as it is when you get time to set up off of a made shot. So it's kind of that steamroller effect. We would can't come in close two minutes to go before the half. We're within seven. It's 32 to 25. In that next two minutes, they roll off 10 points, 42 to 25 at halftime. Then they come out on fire like 16 to three or something like that to open up the second half. And that third quarter was like 38 to six or 36 to eight. I mean, just really opened it up. When they got going, everything just went right for them. Yeah, it, it's really hard to combat that because yeah. if the shots are not falling, you are not going to dig out of that hole. Sure. Mar yeah. Marshall, when they get in a hole, needs to be that trading three for two type team. That's how they get in it. That's how they get hot and they go on the run. And the next thing you know, we go on that 35 to six run and it didn't happen in this game. It was, mm -hmm. it was used against us. I'll tell you in another area where Marshall usually makes massive strides that didn't happen in this one. And that's in the turnover game. It, it's yeah. 15 apiece. You yeah. know, usually we see Marshall forcing two, two for every one they have or better, you know, and it just, yeah. it just was not their game. So uh, a bad matchup, right? The, the height mm -hmm. was just too much. Uh, even without, you know, the six foot sixer, all them three time All American. Well, Strack, uh, Clara Strack, a freshman making her first career start. They kept saying that in this game. There she goes, stands six foot five. And you mentioned our tallest player, six foot one. And Strack goes, uh, has 17 points early. She had 10 points early, like yeah. 10 of their first 20 or 22 or something like that. Uh, it was just a bad matchup for the herd. And when you calculate the, the shots not falling, there was just no way it was going to happen. Marshall could not get on too many good runs and sustain them in this one. And that's, I know that's frustrating for them because they're used to playing from behind in just about every game, but always catching that fire and being able to go on a run, take a lead, extend a lead. You know, we're the, usually the ones getting other teams flustered and it just didn't happen in this one. And yeah, Virginia takes a really good team. And on top of everything we talked about, they had the luxury of a packed house full mm -hmm. of loud Hokie fans. So there's just not much you're going to be able to do. I, I did err here. I went and looked at their roster. Uh, their point guard, Amor, who is a, a fantastic player, she is only 5'6". Uh, so she was the only player that gets significant playing time that was below that six-foot mark. Uh, everyone else is right there at six foot or above. You got six two, six two, six six. Who didn't play six five? Who you talked about here? And then five six, um, and then coming in off the bench, Eck, who just absolutely tore it up from uh, behind the arc, is a six foot guard. Uh, you got some others on the bench that are six foot and six two coming in as guards. I mean, it's just a lot of length. Uh, they, they get in that passing lane with the longer wingspan and everything. It forced a lot of turnovers on us because we had to throw the ball over top of them uh, when they were pressing us. And it, it just, it is what it is. Yeah. Only thing that I want to say, I said this on Twitter and I got a couple of people for, that were Virginia Tech fans, you know, uh, questioning it. But I said not that, the foul discrepancy has anything to do with this game, but they were calling everything on us. At one point we had 25 fouls to their 10 and it seemed like everything that we did arms would be straight up in the air. Hey, sorry. That's a foul. Uh, a lot of fouls off the ball, things like that. It's things like that. If the refs are going to say, well, the only way that this team that is so inferior, because we already know in our heads that they're inferior, uh, we've got it made up that the only way that they could do something is if they were fouling, you know, it, it's things like that, that you're never going to come back from 25 down. So once it gets to that point, you know, they're in the double bonus Every time that you go down the court, all they got to do is hit a free throw or two or whatever. It's hard to make a run like that. Yeah. And it, it would not have changed the outcome of the game. I wasn't saying that it would have. Um, 
but it was clear to me when Ashley Tudor played a grand total of five minutes and she had fouled out with 645 left in the third quarter after five minutes of being on the court and two of the fouls were back to back. Um, it's just like, Hey, she hasn't done that all year. She hasn't gone in and fouled out. We don't foul out a lot. Yeah. We, do, we do the changing of, and we just, we had people in foul trouble and it, it just seemed like at every time we were turning around and go, what did, what, what did I do? How, what, tell me what I did with the foul. So I'm not one to, to really blame officiating and i know that's not what you're doing mm -hmm. but when you're in a tournament setting people pay closer attention to that mm -hmm. you know and, and you can't have a you know glaring disparity it has to be pretty even in overall team fouls if the game is played fairly evenly you know unless some unless one team's out there just being egregious and hacking the hell out of some yeah. you know if it's a if it's a if it's a competitively played game and it's not just blatantly obvious then you would expect those to be closer uh, overall team foul numbers and when they're not people are like what the hell's going on here because i'll tell you this it, that's that's claims that have already been made in other games across right. the ncaa tournament and it's usually at the cost of the mid-major team so yeah. it, it, it's all it, you're like you're right it's like it's not it's like it's on purpose right but damn man you know and, mm -hmm. and and the continuation of my tweet, the second half of that, is that in multiple sports, not just basketball, yeah. not just women's basketball. Oh, yeah. The penalties how, in football. Hell the yeah. penalties in football. It, usually what is it? It's pass interference. You know, yeah. they'll, they'll call it on that and say, well, the only way that they could have broken that up is if he would have interfered. I mean, they're playing Alabama. They're playing out Ohio State. So those teams always get what I always consider the Michael Jordan respect. You know, there's even a clip on YouTube of uh, Michael going to the ref and a long time after the whistle and saying, yeah, yeah, he fouled me. And it was like, okay, you know, and he, he calls a foul. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's like that, you know, that Michael got to do the hand checking and stuff like that. Uh, but if he missed or whatever, you know, like, well, it's Michael. So they had to have fouled him for him to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is it's just it seems to be that the mid majors and lower never get that benefit of the doubt it is yeah. so rare when you see that that it's called evenly or in favor of those uh lower tiered teams yeah well anyway you slice this one it was a great week you know there was a lot of celebration around herd women's basketball absolutely Celebrate, celebrated two championships in the same yeah. season we got to watch them on Selection Sunday, you know, mm -hmm. from the student center. And that whole that just that whole visual is always cool because oh, I yeah. like I like that anyway. When yeah. these teams like we didn't we weren't on the bubble. We knew we were in, mm -hmm. but I love watching whatever school, XYZ University, see their name pop up when it's not something they're used to seeing all the time. And that was a really special week. And, and you know, we got we we had the national media talking to our head coach. We had the national media talking to our Sun Belt Player of the Year. You know, and that is a huge recruiting tool because we play an exciting brand of basketball. We're winning a lot of games. We've got a very, um, very player friendly system with all the line change type substitutions. A lot of people are going to play, yeah. and now you get to do it in front of a national audience. So they're you just open up a lot more eyeballs to potential recruits, transfer portal players that go, hey, I think maybe I can go play for Coach Kim. This ought to, They look like they are a lot of fun. Mm. So let's see how that goes. The last thing I want to say is how about the shirt? I mean, I made a shirt today. I felt like it was perfect. Yep. Um, I know you guys that are listening on audio, you, you can't see it, but, hey, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Go to the YouTube, find the uh, link to this. Uh, this episode and check out my sweet shirt. So just wasn't enough to overcome the, you know, the 40 point disparity and, and overall advantages in this game, but damn it, I don't care. I'm proud as hell of them. I'm proud as hell of our coach, our staff, every one of our players, you gave us all so many great memories, all time plays, all time players on this one and two championships in the same season. You cannot freaking beat that Russ. If you got nothing else, let's go around to her. 
Yeah, we're going to start with volleyball for Around the Herd, and they've got their banquet coming up on April the 20th at Christopher's Eats. It'll be 6 p.m. Uh, now, we know that that's going to be at the tail end of the green and white game. Mm -hmm. uh, it just mm -hmm. happened to fall on that weekend. But it's $50 per ticket, and if you want to sponsor a student athlete, $30 to do that. Uh, go have a great meal with the volleyball team. Help them with their championship fund. Uh, more info, I'm sure, will come when it gets closer to the date on what other activities that will surround that. But right now, circle that date on your calendar. If you won't be at the green and white game, or if you go to the first part of the green and white game and peel off, make sure you get to the volleyball banquet. Help them raise money. I like it. All right. Men's soccer. They had a one nothing win over Xavier, and that has Marshall, of course, pretty much out of reach to be caught in that uh, East division. I believe it's the East and uh, the college spring league. They have three victories. Now that's nine points, three points per victory. Second place in their division has three points. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now we have played one other game than that team, but it's still, it's getting to be where we've almost clinched uh, our division in that one more game, I believe. Uh, before they play the final four, I think it is. Okay. All right, track and field. Now, I have to say, we're going to start off with some signings, but there was a lot of stuff that happened earlier today that I'm not going to have everything for. I'll lean on you a little bit on that. But uh, let's go with the signings first. Pick up uh, Mason Kaufman, Addison Gerke, and Micah Hinton. And again, we don't know in track and field, we say this every time, we don't really know what event or events that these uh, athletes will be in. So we just welcomed them to the herd. Their outdoor season, you mentioned this earlier, it has begun and last weekend kicked it off at the Charlotte 49ers Classic and then this weekend playing the FSU Relays. Last week saw relay victories and runners, runners up in several events. Um, don't want to go through every single team uh, team of four won in multiple different events. You can find that on Herd Zone. Do want to give uh, a shout out to a couple of individuals here. Um, Tyra Thomas was third in the 100 meter hurdles. Rebecca Merritt placed fourth in the hammer and discus throws. Laura Check this week set a personal record in the high jump. Rebecca Merritt had the second best hammer throw in school history. 58.14 meters, and that got her second in the event. Uh, you had some other stuff that we talked about briefly before the show hit, if you want to highlight that real quick. Yeah, this is the FSU Relays, right? Yeah. So uh, this is a pretty marquee event for the herd to take part in. And uh, we overall, we did okay, right? We had some personal, um, pretty good personal finishes. Uh, but you mentioned the ones from uh, previously like Rebecca Merritt and, and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, we had a couple of win or a win. Actually, I won't say a couple of wins. It was a one, two finish. We finished first and second in the 1500 meters. Ronnie Saunders gets Ronnie Saunders gets the dub. Evan white is um, comes in second in the event and Kylie Maston big time. Doesn't she did not get the win in the, in the, uh, in this event, but she recorded the first sub 210 800 in school history. I so did. a brand new school record for big time. She ran a 209.81, the first ever sub 210 800 meter run. Again, and if you, what else would you expect? You go find the photo on Twitter of her big, huge, big time smile, just like. It's like my favorite thing whenever she breaks a record. So I've seen that big smile, that happy face, all I never get tired of it. Right. So pretty good showing for the herd down in FSU <clears throat> for the FSU relays. Um, this program is on an uptick signings every week. Uh, we're coming out and, and I, I love the one, two finish. That is awesome. You know, that's a, that's, that's a big deal, man. And they did it in the rain. It was dreary. These guys are drenched. I mean, they're running, in the rain out there and doesn't surprise you when where, where there's rain, there may be some thunder and, and we brought in a first and second place finish. So awesome 
for the herd down in the sun, the rainy sunshine state. Yeah. And I was at, after the basketball game, I drove over as quickly as I could to get to the baseball game. And I was over there until right at recording. So that's why I didn't have a lot of the notes on stuff that happened earlier. Appreciate uh, the pickup there on track and field. Let's talk tennis. They uh, swept Troy at home on Friday, seven to nothing. And then they turned around on Sunday and won four to three. They picked up the doubles win on there and then uh, finished real strong in singles to get that victory. Always good after that uh, matchup against ODU to come in and get a couple of uh, victories. They are at Arkansas State tomorrow, which is Saturday. We're recording Friday night. And then on Sunday, they'll be at Louisiana Monroe. Nice. Yeah, we expect them to – I told you, it was tough to play – to have to face Old Dominion right out of the gate in the SEC yep. slate, expect. I just expect now a big, long run of wins to come through until we match up with James Madison. That will be a coin flip because James Madison's also very tough. You can't guarantee a win. You can't guarantee a loss. It's just going to be one of those ones. But until then, I expect the herd to just do what the herd has been doing and winning. Uh, men's golf, Marshall finished 10th out of 15th at the ECU intercollegiate, uh, with a solid final round in really cold conditions, started off about 36 degrees there on that final round, uh, moved them up a few slots with that strong showing. They were led by Tyler Jones tied for 16th overall at uh, seven over par and Ryan Bilby tied for 20th at eight over par, just one stroke behind. Uh, Bilby had one of the rare rounds. I think there was only seven players that had any round that was under par, and he finished under par on that final day to really help the, the team move up. Uh, just like women's golf, they will not be playing until April the 1st, so we don't have anything about them until our next show. We'll highlight where they're going next. All right, baseball, tough road trip. Talked a little bit about this in uh, five things. Tough road trip for the herd opening up their conference slate against yeah. perennial powerhouse <laughs> Southern Miss. And we don't mean Sunbelt Conference powerhouse. National. They're, they're a national <laughs> powerhouse. So what did we do? We went down there. We had a pretty decent showing on really? Friday. Yeah. Lost 8-4. to four. But then that game, we'll talk about it real quick, lost 2-1 to one in 14 innings. You already told us about the ending. Here's what happened, and here's how Bryce Blevins – shored up that pitcher of the week for the Sunbelt Conference through or into the eighth inning. He had a perfect game going mm -hmm. against a no hitter from the Southern Miss guy, just really dueling back and forth in the eighth inning. We hit a home run Firestone. I think is who it was that got our home run. And uh, we're up one to nothing with a perfect game on the line. Then in the bottom of the eighth Southern Miss hits one out. So it's one to one, and it stayed that way with only a couple of hits from each side. Blevins finished nine innings. Uh, I think the one hit, maybe it was two that he had, struck out nine, I think. 90 pitches was all yeah. he 90 pitches in nine innings against this Southern Miss team. If you got to watch any of the game, which I did, he was dealing like Tom Browning used to do. He's also a lefty. But as soon as the ball came back into his glove, he was just right into his windup. Um, the announcers for Southern Miss were talking that they had not seen anyone that just so in the groove that as soon as it came back, he was ready to pitch again. They had no answers for him. Again, the ending, I'm going to be on the opposite side. You said it sucked, but I will say they got the call right. His foot was in front of the plate. I do think it's a stupid rule because he was out by 12, 15 feet. You know, it was so inconsequential. He could have taken his glove off and taken the ball and touched him. I mean, that's how much time he had. Stupid rule. I know they do it to protect the catchers. Uh, we saw Buster Posey in the majors get his leg shattered on, on a play that was similar to that. And they do this so – you cannot just bowl over the catcher. And if you can't bowl over the catcher, the catcher can't block the plate before he gets the ball. His foot was in front of home plate while the ball was still coming to him. That's obstruction. He was out. Right call by the rule book. Horrible call because it's a horrible rule. 
And, okay, maybe right call by the rule book, but when you say he was out by 15 feet, that's a bad application of the rule. I know. Because nobody's bowling anybody over at that point. You know? I know, but if you're the umpire and you are forced to go by the rule, by the way, he called him out, and it was appeal by the uh, the Southern Miss coach to go review the call, and they spent a good five, seven minutes on it and went back and the umpire came out and didn't make a signal. He went over to talk to coach bills before yeah. he made the, and like you said, coach bills had every right to go off again, horrible call just in the application of it. The rule should not apply when it's that egregious that the guy's out. Um, anyway, we <laughs> <laughs> also, I feel like if that game is in Huntington, that that cause is like, nope, he's out. You know what I mean? Well, the ump wouldn't have made it out of Huntington if he <laughs> did call him out. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I, I'm not saying you're wrong, right? But right. we saw the very same weekend a more egregious um, obstruction not called. Like, But in that one, that was a more egregious blocking of the plate but he had the ball already in his possession when he blocked the plate even worse than he did. That is the nuances of that rule. Before you have the ball, no foot, arm, anything can block access to a sliding path of home plate. Once you get the ball, you can go over there and build a wall, a fort, if you want to. But <laughs> while the ball is still traveling to you, you can't put your foot there, and that's the reason they did that, and that was – after that Buster Posey play in the majors years ago. It sounds like they need a, you know how they have uh, the, the, the zone under the basket, you know, mm -hmm. that you can't, uh, I don't know what it is. You can't draw a, a charging call or sure. something like that. Right. They need a line somewhere up the third baseline at some point. So that when you are in a review process, you can say, okay, well, we've got a foot in front of the plate, but the runner's way back here. And, and he ends up being out by a mile. You know I don't, what I'm saying? I don't think you need to do a line. I think you say, has he entered his slide yet? You know? I mean, because you can you can clearly <laughs> see that in the review. Don't make you know? me start dive sliding from halfway down the baseline. Like, yeah, it was in his slide. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you can do like Willie Mays Hayes and you can slide <laughs> and still crawl and make it to the base, go ahead. But you can see, I mean, that's how – Far this guy was out. Yeah. I mean, you know, he he was out by a mile. Um, but anyway, that was the Saturday game, a hell of a game. If you've got two hours and 47 minutes, I think is what it is on the SPM Plus, and you want to go look that up on demand, it's a hell of a game. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sunday, we came back with all seven to five. So, yes, we got swept by Southern Miss. But, one, they're a hell of a team like we talked about. Two, we got a lot of respect by everyone in the league and especially Southern Miss with how we're playing. We have been talking about, you know, the night before the first game of the Jack was the first time that our players actually got to go into their clubhouse and use their lockers. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. No one else in the league was changing in cars or changing, you know, outside or, you know, trying to find a place to to change at the YMCA uh, Lee, or field up on Route 2. Now, after this entire year of getting to play and practice in a facility and all that stuff with the indoor facility as the clubhouse progresses and everything, that's when you're going to see this team really take off. So I'm not saying that we we don't expect anything out of them this year. I'm just saying that you're not going to see the rewards and the benefits of this facility until you get into next year. And we went down already and put it to Southern Miss and got their respect. I think that's showing that our baseball program is on the rise, and I cannot wait to see when we get more and more of Coach Bills' recruits in here and everyone gets to have – full use of this indoor practice facility, the clubhouse, the field, and just see how this team takes it to the next level. Yeah. We all know it's a multi-season build. We know that. This we expect more from this team than the team we had last year. Right. Mm -hmm. That that's 
that's the fair part of it. And then next year we will expect more from that team than we are expecting this year until the full complex is built and the guys have had a couple of years to um, have access to everything and you get the opportunity to put in a couple of recruiting classes and portal classes and all that kind of stuff. And then you, then is when you can start to say, all right, why is it not progressing like we had hoped or, damn, this is really progressing better than we had hoped. That's when yeah. you get to start asking those questions. I think we're all, we're all on the same page with that. Yeah, It's just when you lose games against really good teams in the fashion that that one went down, it's going to sting. Because yeah. if that one goes around the other way and you're like, wow, look what we did. We went down and beat this perennial top 25 team, this perennial NCAA tournament team at their house. And our pitcher threw had a perfect game going into the. It's those things. If that turns yeah. out to be a win, that you're like, all right, you know, we're doing something. So it looks like three losses. It is three losses on the schedule, but um, I think internally the guys know that that one slipped away from them, and it wasn't their doing necessarily. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, the game after not nearly as good. We got shellacked at WVU, fifteen to nothing, and. Uh, there's not really much more to say that on that. You know, we <laughs> yeah. went from went from having a hell of a series, even though you come away with three losses, we we had a much better showing in those three losses down there than in the one loss that WVU. However, tonight's game that uh, ended, uh, you know, right before we started recording, they came back, bounced back with a six-two victory. And uh, tell you this line here real quick over Arkansas State. Drew Harlow, only six innings pitched, had eight Ks, one earned run. That was a home run that uh, uh, he gave up for his only real mistake. Great game by Drew Harlow. And that was one of the things that the Southern Miss fans were talking about is how our pitching was really, really top-notch. So get a couple more starts like that. It's going to be hard in a three-game series if you can throw – uh, Bryce Blevins, the way he's been throwing, a Drew Harlow like he threw tonight, throw in somebody else doing that. All you got to do is get a few runs on the board, and you've got yourself a couple of wins. Yeah, let me let me throw one more thing about uh, Bryce Blevins and what he's done this season so far with so much of the season left to go before we transition over to presumably softball. Uh, I saw that Bryce Blevins is the first Marshall pitcher to pick up multiple Pitchers of the Week awards in the same season since all the way back when Aaron Blair did it. Mm -hmm. So for herd baseball fans that go back that far, that's not too terribly far, but you're talking about in excess of probably a decade or right around a decade. Aaron Blair was a great one. He was a first-round MLB draft pick for the herd. So Bryce Blevins in some mega rarefied air with the job he's doing in this early, early Sunbelt season. That was the uh, trivia question at the stadium tonight at the Jack that they uh, asked. All right, so we are moving to softball to wrap up around the herd. Let's talk about what they did. Uh, they kicked off their conference slate with a series win over Georgia Southern. They had a loss on Friday, 4-3. to three. They gave up a, I'm talking, fence scraper. And <laughs> I got that because I was right behind the fence in center field, and it hit the top of the fence. My daughter... My oldest daughter, Caitlin, actually went over and got the ball, and uh, the Georgia State dad was on the phone. It was his daughter that hit it, and he came over, and he was like, hey, that was my daughter that hit that. And I was like, she'll give it to you. And Caitlin went over and gave him the ball, and he was obviously proud like we would be of our, our sure. children. But that three-run shot, other than that, we pretty much shut him down the whole game. We lost four to three. Um we ended up with a six to one victory on uh, Saturday, and then a nine to one victory in six innings on Sunday. I will talk about that Saturday game just a little bit more uh, in my closing thoughts uh, because it has to deal with uh, my uh, middle child, Evelyn. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we ended up going to Kentucky on Wednesday and lost to number twenty three Kentucky seven to nothing. And then they are at Southern Miss tonight. I do not have that score either. I, I got it. I, I figured you did. That's why I'm throwing it to you. <laughs> Heard picks up the opening game win of the Southern Miss series, six to three, behind a three-run shot from 
Brooklyn Ulrich to lead the charge in that one. Uh, reunited with a herd great, great yeah. gentleman, friend of the Thundercast, all around great person. Uh, we got to know their her family a little bit from last season and you know, Grace went down and, and uh, was coaching in one of the collegiate leagues this summer. Yep. And then that uh, kind of snowballed into an assistant coaching job at Southern Miss. So I'm assuming that's why they reconnected with her, that she is indeed still on staff she down is. at Southern Miss, which is super cool. But uh, I, I know that's not a place you want to be, not not Hattiesburg. But, I mean, as if I'm Grace, I don't want to be – on the payroll for team a but my alma mater that i was just playing for last year is coming in to play you know i want my team to win but i want my team to win and i don't envy being in that position this weekend for grace but all smiles it was great for her to reconnect with some of her former teammates and i'm really glad that the herd was able to pick up the series opening win against southern miss six to three game two will be tomorrow I'm going to ask, but I need to find out if Allie gave her some Skittles. Well, well, she, they're still doing that, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, but I know. Do you do you give them to everybody, and then when you see Grace, say, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry these are for herd players, and uh, <laughs> you're now on the opposing team. But uh, I did not mention this uh, on baseball, so I'll backtrack on this because it has to do with this as well. Uh, both of those games were uh, Friday at 6, and then both baseball and softball are tomorrow at 3. Of course, home for baseball at the Jack, down in Hattiesburg for softball. And then softball plays at noon on Sunday, and baseball is at 1. So catch them either live or on ESPN Plus uh, for the softball game. Awesome. All right, that does it for Around the Herd, sir. We awesome. got out of here a little early. You got any closing thoughts? I've got some if you don't. I just want to take one more opportunity and um, say, A, congratulations to the Herd women's basketball team on a historic season. Uh, first time they've went to, they went to the NCAA tournament since 1997, which would have been before we got to Marshall. We wouldn't have gotten to Marshall until the fall of 1997. So that tournament run this season even predates Russ and I, <laughs> as far as our Marshall careers. Fans maybe before that, but our Marshall careers. We weren't students yet. Um, I've got to say thank you to all of those players that that worked their asses off to put the team on the floor that we came to love by the middle of the season, the, the the first third of the season, when they were a 500 team early. And they just ripped off two 10-game win streaks at different points in the season, captured a regular season Sunbelt title, a, regu- a, a, a Sunbelt Conference Tournament Championship, landed the Player of the Year, the Coach of the Year, two players on the all-tournament team. I can't say thank you enough for captivating me personally, us as the Thundercast, and so many fans in the Herd universe, and a set an all-time attendance record to prove it. This program, I will say it, as long as Kim Caldwell is our head coach, the sky is the freaking limit. Mm-hmm. You talked about the, the height uh, disparity against Virginia Tech. And I wouldn't trade players like Abby Beeman for anyone. I Same. wouldn't trade Bri- I wouldn't trade Brianna Campbell for anyone. Yeah. I wouldn't trade Meredith Mayer for anyone, right? These are great players. It doesn't matter that they're a little shorter in stature. What I will say is, can you imagine if Coach Kim can hit the portal and hit the recruiting trail? and start landing players that play like that that also happen to be 6'1", 6'2", 6'3". If that happens, this team is a really, really dangerous team because the mismatches that occurred in this one no longer occur. And I know there are players out there across the country that play that aggressive, relentless style of basketball that would thrive, thrive under Coach Caldwell. Thank you to Coach Kim. 
thank you to her entire staff and every single player that laced them up for Herd Women's Basketball this season. It did not go unnoticed, and uh, I am so thankful that I got to watch so much. The only thing that I regret is that I did not get to see any of it live and in person, but I am glad we got to send countless fans to their first game this season. I know we built fans, and we built season ticket holders for next season. I went to as many as I could. I think I missed one home game, maybe two home games, but uh, with with scheduling issues. It is a great, great value and a wonderful time. Uh, my closing thoughts, I want to talk about that Saturday softball game from last, last week. Um, at the softball banquet, I bid on a couple of things, and one of the things that I won was uh, Batgirl for a game. And I got two of those, and we exercised the first one of those. And uh, Coach Circle said, you know, is Saturday good for Evelyn? And I said, sure. So I took my eight-year-old Evelyn. And for those of you that have seen this, if you follow me on Twitter or if you don't follow me but it came across your feed, you probably saw a lot of this. They took her in the dugout. They assigned someone to watch over her to, you know, make sure that she went out to the right places at the right time and and everything. And she had a blast. And they took her out for the pregame dance. Uh, you know, and <laughs> I saw I, that. <laughs> and and yes, Evelyn done turned into a rude dude uh, <laughs> with the rest of the team. And then at the. Uh, handshake line when they're announcing, you know, she got to be the last person that they uh, gave high fives to as they ran out on the field, as they were announcing the starting lineup, she got to uh, take malls to the umpire at home plate in between innings. And he was engaging her and, and having a good time. Yes. Even blue who we all hate, <laughs> you know, was, was showing my daughter a, uh, a good time. Found some uh, humanity in the yeah, umpire. <laughs> yeah. He, he got to see her somehow. He was able to see her. I don't know how, cause he's blind. Blue is blind. We all know that. But coach Zirkle, uh, the rest of the team, um, the coaching staff, everyone took amazing care of her. She had a blast when I went to get her from the dugout after the game. She was just all smiles. Um, and you know, she's tiny and she comes running in this shirt that is down to her knees and she's got the batting <laughs> helmet on looking like dark helmet from Spaceballs. <laughs> and she says, daddy, daddy, thank you so much. I had a blast. They had snacks, and that's that's all she cared about <laughs> was that they had snacks. But why am I telling you this story? One, I'm a proud dad to see her out there doing that and having fun. But two, these are the kind of things when you go to these banquets and they have these silent auctions that you can make memories of a lifetime for your children. Yes, you can go pick up some memorabilia. Yes, you can do whatever. And yes, you may say, well, I just want to support the team and everything. I don't really care about what I get in return. Think about bidding on these things where you could have a Batgirl for a game. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we did that every game and someone gave money, think of how that helps the championship fund for softball when – that is something that you can get back that is way more valuable than a signed shirt or a hat. Sure. And and just seeing Evelyn and I can't wait until Caitlin gets to do it. But when you see the smiles on their face and you see, I think that they had just as much fun, the softball team, even though they had business to take care of, I think they had just as much fun from Evelyn being in there as Evelyn did uh, being in there. So just think about that, guys, when you're going to these things. And uh, that's why you want to go and you want to participate and do that and create these memories. I, I I would have paid 10 times as much to see that. It, well, it was it was that special. I'm sure they'd let you if you they would. <laughs> they would. In <laughs> fact, would. in fact, edit that out. So if anybody's <laughs> listening, <laughs> they don't come and ask me for more money. <laughs> No, that was a really cool story. I saw some of those videos, and um, she looks like Evelyn looked like she was having the time of her life. Yes, she did get her dad's rhythm. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but 
you know, she's she looked like she was having a lot of fun. Now, I'll tell you, you saw that dance on there, and she was trying to learn that. But at, in the autograph line after the game when they set the tables up, they were all telling me that she was teaching them dances. Oh. And and uh, the first one was the stanky leg. So <laughs> I, th- I, think that, I think that she does just fine dancing. Yeah. She's doing just fine. Man, that's an awesome way to, t- to close this one out. So uh, if you got nothing else, then let's actually take it out. Now, whether you see us at the Jack, whether you see us at the Joan, or whether you see us in the dugout over at the Dot doing the stanky leg, you never know where you're going to see the Thundercast, but wherever you see us, we're going to be saying, go hurt. Go hurt. It's the Thundercast. We'll see you next week. Later.